Good evening, everyone. My name is Rowan Workman. I'm the manager of the Melbourne Accelerator Program. And it's a delight to welcome you here tonight to a very special public forum. We're very uh, glad to have been able to secure Clive Dickens as our uh, speaker for this evening. Clive has done a number of things throughout his career. He has been one of the, an advisor to the uh, founders of Shazam. He is also an advisor to One to One Cast, who is here tonight, one of the map companies from 2012. Uh, he's also the director of the Digital and Innovation Strategy at SCA. So for those of you who live in Melbourne, uh, Triple M and Fox radio stations are part of SCA. And tonight he is here to kind of have a chat to us about how what he has learned over his career has shaped what he's doing now or is shaping what he's doing now. And hopefully some of the insights that he has taken from his career can be applied to those of us who are either starting out our careers or also starting a new business or working in a corporate um, tonight is being filmed, as you can see, and so it will go onto the MAP YouTube channel. Um, if you'd prefer not to be filmed, then please move to the edge of the picture um, and don't ask any questions. Um, but we also have, um, we'll also have about a 40-minute presentation and then some Q&A and then some drinks and canapes to follow. But uh, without any further ado, would you please make welcome Clive Dickens. Thank you. Thank you. Can, I, can I move to the edge of the room? Or we've got my... um, Thanks for coming out on this wet uh, Victorian evening. I uh, really appreciate it. I'm sorry I was a bit late. The uh, vagaries of uh, Virgin Australia's scheduling, they just text you and say, sorry, the flight's cancelled, get the next one. Um, so you're going to take about 40 minutes of your time, as Rowan said, to share some of the things that I'm doing and some of the things that I've learned about that maybe, maybe a few of them might be helpful as you either embark on your startup journey or whether you're in the middle of it or whether you're in your second or third. Um, to kick us off though, does anyone know who Edward Land is? Edward Land? Polaroid camera. So, there's, so recently I've been using a lot of quotes on Edwin and that's the first room I've come into where someone's heard of him. But I would hope that the <laughs> Melbourne Accelerator program would know who Edwin was. Yes, he's the um, famed inventor of many patents and inventions and most famously the Polaroid camera. And uh, he was also renowned as a lots of very inspirational uh, entrepreneurs for some very uh, interesting quotes, and here's one. We live in a world changing so rapidly uh, that what we mean frequently by common sense is the thing that would have been we would have been doing right last year. And I think that is, for me, absolutely summing up what is going on in the world at the moment, particularly in the digital economy. Things are moving so fast, and and uh, in my company, where we're a sort of common sense media company, I'm the sort of disruptive role that says, well, whatever we were doing last year. Uh, is no longer relevant. And I only really discovered Edwin in the last couple of years. Um, and I started reading a lot about his work when I found out that he was one of the people who Steve Jobs claims had the most influence over his life. So I'm sure the people who know that um, would know that. And I found that really interesting. So I thought I'd learn a little bit more about him. The other thing about Edwin that I thought was interesting is um, there's a really fascinating analyst who I recommend you follow called Benedict Evans. He's a British guy who, who I know in London has just moved over to work for um, a really good VC in the Valley and uh, just one of the most incredible mobile analysts in the world right now. And um, he doesn't ever seem to sleep. I mean, I, you know, it's unbelievable what the stuff he comes out with. And he recently um, uh, came out with um, some an insight where he claimed that um, he was talking about Edwin Land, he was talking about the impact of Polaroid on photography and then digital photography on Kodak and then mobiles on cameras. And uh, his estimate indicated that just simply on WhatsApp in the first six months of this calendar year in the world, so we're talking about obviously a big product but still nowhere near sort of like mainstream adoption in the West. So it's, uh, I'm sure a lot of people in the room use it, but if I go into a room of clients and colleagues, I get a few hands because it's dominated by a certain geography and demography. But just taking WhatsApp and more photos have been shared in the first six months of 2014 in WhatsApp alone than were printed on Earth in the whole of the year 1999, which apparently was the peak year when photography peaked in terms of printed photography, where people were sent off their films into envelopes. My God, doesn't that seem so alien 
sending a film off into an envelope and then waiting and wondering whether someone was going to look at the photos and send them back. So 1999 was the peak. That was the time to sell your Kodak shares. And 2014, in the first six months of WhatsApp alone, more photos have been shared. And the fact that most of those are selfies, I'm not sure what that says about society. So briefly, this is a sort of like a potted history of me. I'm going to sort of dive into a couple of these to give you some experiences. But what does this really tell us? Well, left-hand side of the page is broadcast and content businesses. Never very far from a studio, never very far from a piece of content. Right inside the page, um, startups and disruptions and, and technology. I've always had this sort of fascinated hybrid career where I've been able to walk from corporate to startup, from content to tech. And, um, and I'm not sure where that came from. I was trying to decode that. I think it was sort of, I was very fortunate. I grew up in 80s England where we were the first generation people to have computers in schools in the 70s, in the late 70s. Computers in schools funded by the BBC. That was a BBC computer program. And if you talk to um, CEO of ARM, who is ARM Processors, one of the most successful British tech companies and the companies like Imagination Technologies, multi-billion pound tech companies who have founders or chief executives in their 40s, they all say the same thing. They all say it was that computer in that school in 1980, 1979, and then that went on to create Sinclair Research and ZX80, ZX81, Spectrum. And by 1982, there were 150 computer companies in England alone producing personal computers. So I just really fortunate to grow up in the right place. So 30 years of sort of jumping from content to technology, 30 years from working in um, almost 30 countries, as either as a colleague, a advisor, a speaker, or a consultant, we created a whole new brand uh, called Absolute Radio. And Absolute Radio became almost like an R&D shop for broadcasting, particularly radio broadcasting, in what has become one of the most dynamic startup cities in the world and definitely in Europe. You know, London and Berlin have a bit of a, like two Formula One cars on the grid. And, um, and we really did something quite different there. So rather than just create another radio station, at the end of five long, hard years, we had taken what was a very traditional radio business, which was distributed on AM and FM and digitally, and become one of the most leading digital radio brands in the world. What does that mean? Well, a couple of metrics as of last week, 85% of all Absolute Radio's listening is no longer on AM or FM. Even though they have an AM and FM network transmission, migrated to some form of digital broadcasting, and over 50% of its revenues are no longer based on spot advertising, based on any form of other metrics from spot advertising, which is the by far the big funder for broadcast media. And we bought the business and it had about 1.8 million listeners. And last week, um, it just clicked, just got to 4 million audience. And we literally blew up a really famous brand. And we did it by crowdsourcing all of the elements to it. And, and uh, one of the key things that our moment of success there was that we, we bought this business. It had a Virgin Lab brand license that we had to give 100 days notice on, which is what happens. There's quite a lot of businesses in the UK of failed Virgin businesses. Um, there's less around the world. It's sort of kept the, the machine going a bit more around the world. The UK is not quite so successful. So there's quite a lot of failed businesses. And when you become a business, you have 100 days to basically uh, remove any trace of Virgin brand, because it's a brilliant brand, right, from the business. And it's almost like when you go to a shop and they, when they close a shop these days, they'll try and take down the brand so you almost forget that it was ever there, whether it was a star, failed Starbucks or, or a failed European fashion brand. So we had 100 days to remove something like 27,000 images from what was the UK's largest radio website at the time. And uh, my, my head of digital came to me and said, well, we're going to have to employ five people working six days a week who are going to have to look at every single photo and work out whether this photo has got a brand trademark in it or whether it doesn't, because we could just take them all off, but that's all our content. And the only way of working out whether this is an infringed photo is a human being has to look at it and decide, you know, and effectively, is it a virgin or is it not a virgin? And of course, we didn't want to strip all the photos down because that was all providing all of our content. So he'd done this little maths and said, like, five people, six days, 90 days work. That would cost, I need an extra 10,000 pounds. And I said, no, that's not going to work. Um, here's 50 pounds. Go down the pub and work out how you're going to do it. <laughs> he sort of went, well, I told you how much it's going to cost, but I'll take your 50 pounds because we've been working all day and we're going to spend it at the pub. He came back from the pub about five minutes later, gave me the 50 pounds and says, we've worked it out. He says, what are we going to do? We're going to create a script where every single photo is going to be served into a viewer 
and we're into online viewer, and we're going to ask every single visitor to moderate this photo. Photo, and whilst if every photo of twenty-seven thousand photos, once every single one of them has been moderated by ten visitors, um, then we will then strip that photo automatically from the site, getting our audience to do the work for us. It was genius, and of course, what it did. There was about 10,000 of our loyal visitors basically saw this as a game. They said, so we need your help. We need to strip the Virgin logo from the site. There are loads of images that need to be moderated by a human being. And what would have, should have taken six weeks and five people and 10,000 pounds was done in 48 hours. And we built from the very beginning this incredible brand journey where the early advocates of the brand were building the brand for us. And that was when that was 2008. Now, of course, crowdsourcing and peer-to-peer -peer economy and all the things that spin from that are now very well known. But that was my first taste of a sort of next wave when we were still saying Web 2.0 back in those days, where actually the solutions that, that are in front of us are not often the most obvious ones. So next thing, one of the other things I think is relevant is a business that um, I helped found called Radio Player. Radio Player's ambition is to make it easier to listen to radio on the internet. <laughs> to make it easier to people to listen to radio on the internet. Well, why do we even need to make it easier to listen to radio on the internet? So the first 18 years of the internet, if you want to listen to Fox FM or Triple J or, or a um, community station here in Melbourne, what do you got to do? You got to go to Google. You got to Google the brand. You find their website. You find their website, you look for their Listen Live button, you hit their Listen Live button, or you go to the App Store and you search for their app, open their app, same thing. And you go there and, you, oh, okay, and, you, and the Listen Live button or the app is different. And then you, and you, you start a listening session for your favorite radio station or your favorite music source from a radio station. And then what do you want to do? Well, if you want to then switch over to listen to the ABC News, or you want to listen to a bit of footy, or you want to listen to a, a, a specialist program with Triple J and you're listening to Triple M, what have you got to do? You've got to go back to Google, You've got to type in the name of the radio station again. You've got to find a completely different website. You've got a different Listen Live button. It's the most hideous user journey. And up until 2011, that's what we were asking millions of British consumers to do when they were listening to radio online. So we said, we've got to solve this. So we got all of our radio colleagues in the room and said, we have to create one simple interface, desktop and mobile, where people can simply jump from their favorite radio stations online in the same way they jump from their radio, favorite radio stations in the car. And solving problems around aggregation, of course, TuneIn Radio does it spectacularly as well as an independent third party, but of course, why would we not say, well, TuneIn's already doing it? Well, when I share with you that TuneIn is increasingly owned by Google, and when you let Google aggregate your industry that you have no control over, just ask the Fairfax family how that feels, right? So destroying hundreds of million pounds of, of value. And the radio industry in the UK had to fight back against Google. And Radio Player now, three years on, is by far more popular way for people to jump for their favorite radio stations online than using TuneIn or using any form of aggregation app. Really collaborating. Another British startup where I'm really proud to have helped is a business called Audioboo. Has anyone heard of Audioboo? One or two people. Have you ever used it? So, so Audioboo has recently IPO'd. Um, doing incredibly well in the UK and North America, increasingly well here in Australia. So Audioboo's modern mission is to become the SoundCloud for sport. They want to become the SoundCloud for sport. Now, they didn't start out as a SoundCloud for sport. We started it about uh, 2007. It was, it was incubated out of Channel 4, the public service-owned British television channel, as an R&D project for mobile around, effectively, YouTube for audio. And YouTube for audio effectively became really hard and, if it, and ultimately was massively dominated by SoundCloud, um, who basically, even though they came out of a musician, they effectively, and by default, have become the YouTube for audio. And, but Audioboo survived by basically understanding when their time was up and looking for their new niche. Their new niche was that SoundCloud was focusing on bands and DJs and music and occasionally spoken word. And actually, it was the AFL Media and Cricket Australia and the English Premier League, their uses of Audioboo to share their own uh, commentary and goals that gave Audioboo a complete second life to the extent where I think 20 million listens now um, a month for Audioboo content across the world. 
They've just IPOs, raised a whole stack of cash, and SoundCloud for sports is by far the place where they should be. So very much learned from that, that um, there is an opportunity inside an opportunity. <clears throat> I won't, I'm interested in times, I won't talk, talk about Jack Venture, that's another radio brand that I'm involved with. So Code Club, has anyone heard of Code Club Australia? Apart from Ed and Long, I've talked about this, Code Club Australia, yeah. So, so Code Club was founded by a phenomenal entrepreneur in the UK called Claire Sutcliffe. So Claire um, and I independently came to this um, conclusion that the education system in the UK was significantly um, uh, misguided in relation to coding and dev. My particular story on this was my now 12-year-old daughter came home from school about three years ago. Pretty good school report. She's, you know, she's really good. She works hard. She's, you know, does doing really well. By no means a genius. She's working really hard. But in her ICT skills, she was deficient. And you can just imagine the impact in my house of that. I mean, I was like, <laughs> my wife is going, look, she's done really well, numeracy, literacy, but what about these ITC skills, you know? And that she was writing basic HTML, she was doing cloud presentations on Google Docs, and I'm going, something's not right about this. So I went to see the school and said, how have I screwed up here? She can't have bad ICT skills. And she says, yeah, she's really bad at PowerPoint. She can't use Excel, and she refuses to use Word. <laughs> yes! <laughs> yes! And she, the teacher looked at me as if I was like some sort of mini rebellion going on. I said, that's you teach her how to use Microsoft. That's the curriculum. That's what we have. We get free product from Microsoft and ICT skills in the British curriculum circa 2012 were how to use Microsoft. My God. I mean, I've, you know, I think Microsoft is an amazing company, don't get me wrong, but, but teaching and 10 year olds to learn how to use Microsoft at school and expect that to be ICT skills. So, you know, I basically said to my wife, we've got to do something about this. So we sort of, um, as a as parents, we decided to get involved in, went to the school and said, you've got to at least have Macs, you've got to have iPads, you've got to teach them some scratch, you, you know, just have some variety. And they said, we have no money. Oh, damn, no money. So we basically decided with all the time we didn't have to organize an event. Um, and we, we organized a, uh, a parents event, which um, was really successful, managed to raise um, a 5,000 pounds profit in an evening. And we just basically equipped the school with loads of iPads, a proper um, secure Wi-Fi network, and just the things to allow them to at least have some variety of products. And, um, and I thought, well, that was, um, that was it. And then, and then a friend said to me, you should meet Claire Sutcliffe. And uh, I said, well, who's Claire Sutcliffe? Well, Claire is a, um, uh, an entrepreneur in the UK who had come to a similar conclusion, but rather than going to stage a popular barbecue with some wine for, for parents to buy some iPads, she'd basically gone that much further and basically started an after-school network club for children between the ages of 9 and 11 to teaching them to code. In August of 2014, Claire's Club now runs 4,000 after-school clubs in England and Scotland and Wales, where she volunteers, de gets devs to volunteer, and Google have put money into us, and they basically teach the importance of code to seven to nine-year-old children after school. In the same way you can do French or you can do sports. Absolutely amazing. If you look up the amazing talk that she does on TED about the story, she got um, everyone from a royal member of the royal family to Tim Berners-Lee to... Google founders to do a really funny video on YouTube, if we have time at the end I can show, that talks about the importance. And on December of last year, Michael Grove, the British Education Secretary, announced that basic coding was going to be on the primary school curriculum for the very first time. This woman is an incredible force of nature. The only thing was for me, I decided to move my family to Sydney in um, November of 2012, and I got here about April 2013. So I wasn't able to help Claire, which you know, clearly didn't need any help. So myself and a, a colleague of mine who works at for Telstra at Muradee in Sydney, we decided to launch Code Club Australia. Code Club Australia has been running for about 10 weeks. We went set out to do four trial schools to see how we could get on. Within 10 days, we had 15 schools in Victoria and New South Wales who were saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. And it's just finished its first term, and I'm really pleased to say that Google and Telstra have given us all the funds we need to bring this to as many primary schools in Australia as we possibly can. If anybody wants to help, 
build Code Club into the incredible success that it's been in the UK. It's a not-for-profit, philanthropic, charitable exercise to create the next generation of coders. Come and see me afterwards. Now, I've mentioned Muradi. So Muradi, has anyone heard of Muradi? A few people? Oh, good. I thought, hoped you would. So Muradi has got a really interesting story as well. So if you don't know, Muradi is the accelerator program 100% backed by Telstra just going through its first um, phase at the moment. I think their, their presentation night is next week or the week after. And it's got an interesting backstory because it's run by a British friend of mine called Annie Parker, who's another amazing force of nature. And this, the chief executive of Telstra went to, uh, on a field trip to London to um, at guests of the chief executive of Telefonica. Telefonica is Europe's largest telco, and obviously Telstra is Australia's largest telco. And the chief executive has been shown around, like lots of chief executives do, look how brilliant we are. We have this program called WIRA, which is an incredibly successful accelerator program right across Spain, mainland Europe and the UK. Now hundreds of different startups have benefited from it. You know, like half a dozen have gone on to sort of 100 million rounds. It's just phenomenally successful. And, and the chief executive of Telstra was introduced to, the, to Annie by the chief executive of Telefonica. And of course, very, very cheekily, he went back to Sydney and said to Annie, well, it's much sunnier in Sydney than it is in London. How about coming over and doing exactly what you've done for Telefonica in Sydney? Slightly abridged version, I'm sure, of a protracted negotiation. But Annie, who arrived in the country about six months ago, has turned an unbelievably horrible space in King's Cross in Sydney, a 1962 telephone exchange, um, into this incredible creative hotbed of startups and talent. And uh, I'm a mentor in Tamura D. And it's, uh, yet again, just a really great grassroots uh, transformation that's happening here in our great country around um, the accelerator and startup space. Um, Long, Andrew and Ed from uh, from One to One Cast are with us tonight, and uh, a pa pa business I'm truly passionate about. About um, two years ago, I got we've all got our Google Alerts set up. You know, mine involve audio, startups, um, a few other bits and pieces in Australia because we come here on holiday until we moved here. And then I remember this particular day really clearly that my Google Alerts of audio startup on Australia all resolved to one article. And I was like, oh, that's weird because Australia is the holiday destination. Startups is, there's not many startups that focus on audio. And those combination of words together, I think, what was it? Was it the Verge article read? Yeah, it, was it was a Verge. It was like, and it triggered everything. And I just basically hit up Ed on LinkedIn, a Skype call, and said, look, you know, what are we, um, how has this happened? And to cut a long story, long story short, um, I'm really passionate about what Omni are looking to achieve to bringing the world's first truly personal radio experience to your mobile. Um, became a personal advisor to the business about um, 18 months, uh, 22 years ago, 18 months ago. And then SCA has made its first ever digital investment, first ever early stage startup investment into one-to-one -one cost. And we want to do more of that as a big, dumb corporate, if you like, hopefully not so dumb, but you know, we fit into that category, I suppose, um, in a very mature category where you know, 2% revenue growth is a good year, then we are looking to work with brilliant startups. So whether it's resources, support, advice, marketing, equity, investment, debt, whatever it is, we will look at it. But the key filter for us is audio, technology around the media space, disruptive technology, Australian teams, uh, having tech as one of the founders, Absolutely critical to having tech in the founders. A lot of the Australian startups that have contacted me in the last six months say to me, we want to raise $200,000, and when we do that, we're going to bring in a CTO. Uh, no, that's, you know, maybe that works for some, but if you don't have a CTO in your core team and you're going to use your funds to hire somebody, then that's going to be a bit more challenging. So, and it's, uh, we, we're not going to do a waiver type. We're not going to have dozens of these. We won't set up an accelerator program. We won't set up a a working space like Hub Melbourne or York Butter Factory. We're just doing this in a sort of way around ideas, teams, categories that we like. And are really keen to hear from anybody on, in that space. So far, this is the first, so we're not prolific yet, but um, we feel we can really, really add value. And then finally, um, we, a session like this wouldn't be complete without talking about Shazam. 
Now, you know, it's a really silly question, but I suppose I, I should ask it. Has anyone never heard of Shazam? Okay, you know, uh, actually, I have never found anyone in Australia who hasn't, which is fantastic. Okay, so go to the other end of the stream the room. Does, has anyone never found a reason to use Shazam? You know, you've heard of it, you've seen it, but you've never really used it. Okay, so two or three people never found a reason to use it. Okay, that's fair enough. And what about the other extreme? Who's used it today? Okay, but three or four people used it today. Well, that's fascinating as well. And, and who's used it, say, in the last couple of weeks? For most people, fantastic. Well, Shazam is uh, an incredibly successful business today. 3.5 million Australians each month use Shazam. 3.5 million more people in Australia use Shazam than use Twitter. More people use Shazam in Australia than use Twitter. Twitter's figures are 3.2 million. I work with Twitter. These are, I work with Shazam. These are not claims. I know the, these numbers. I saw a few eyebrows raised there. Um, Twitter is, is, is in a very, very niche space of uh, people who, like us, I'm sure there are a lot of Twitter users in the room. But uh, Shazam has been here for 10 years. Uh, 3.5 million active users of Shazam, 8 million lifetime users of Shazam in Australia alone. And um, so clearly there's a lot of inactive or, or less regular users. But 14 years ago, I got a call on my mobile. 14 years ago, I was, I was coming out of a corporate role at another media company, um, starting uh, going to start some new businesses. And I got a call from Chris Barton, who's the founder of Shazam who's the Mark Zuckerberg of Shazam, if you like. And he'd read, he'd read an article that I'd written in a trade magazine how in my belief that at some point in the next 10 years, mobiles were going to be incredibly important to music. And we were going to consume music on our mobiles and buy music on our mobiles. But this was 2000, so no, two, there were at best feature phones from Nokia at that point. No smartphones, not even high-end Nokias in 2000. And I was running a really successful interactive division in London with some great dev and some great team between 95 and 2000. So I'd learned a lot from working with some great people. He said, oh, I've re I read this article and you've got to come and see this thing we've done. And I said, oh, look, you know, I've, I've just literally started my garden leave. I'm going to go and do some startup work. And, you know, says, and I'm going to Sydney. The Olympics are on. It's fantastic in August, September. My wife's from Sydney. He goes, no, no, come and give you 10 minutes of my time. 10 minutes of your time. I've got to show you something. So I walked out to this really dingy little room in London, and uh, there was a laptop and three and the four founders, Philippe, Chris, Deeraj, and Avery. They flicked open their lap, really old Windows laptop. Would have probably been a Windows 98, I suppose. And um, picked up my old Nokia phone, brick of a phone, there was 27 songs on the database. 20 of those songs were Pink Floyd songs, which Chris absolutely obsessed about Pink Floyd. He started playing Money on his Windows Media Player on his laptop, held up my phone to the speaker and dialed 2580 on the phone. I thought, what is he doing? Within about 10 seconds, a premium SMS arrived in my inbox. Remember those premium SMSs? People still send them to Sunrise, apparently. Pre premium SMSs, and it said Money by Pink Floyd. And I was like, it's amazing. How does it work? Well, it's only 27 songs, so it clearly guessed. A, a geeky-looking bloke in the corner called Avery, who's the chief scientist at Shazam today, said rather abruptly, it didn't guess, it's an algorithm. And I, and I rather naively said, well, where do you get it? <laughs> what do you mean, where did I get it? I wrote it. It can identify up to 20 million songs in 10 seconds. And at that point, at that point and many moments after, I realized hanging around with really bright people like the founder of Shazam was going to have a profound impact on my life. They had no money, they had nothing, they had no, hardly anything working, um, they'd raised some money from friends and family, had a few advisors from the record industry on board, and they said, look, can you help us raise some money? Um, uh, yes, I said, that's, you know, how, who are you looking to get money from? I wanted to talk to the radio industry because the radio industry still today and then even 14 years ago was a great provider of tags. They wanted to talk to the record industry to say to the record industry, here's a chance of owning commerce. When the moment when your brain says, I like that, what is it? You should own that. So we spent years going around every radio station saying, you should embed this into your website. You should embed this into mobile. And every single one of my radio contacts looked at me as if to say, is this what you're doing now, Clive? Is this what you're doing now? Because I come out of a really successful corporate job. I went to see every single record company, Universal, Sony, EMI, Warners, including two of the executives are now globally in charge of those companies, Lucian Grange and Rob Stringer from Sony, Lucian's from Universal, and said, you should invest in this. We need $50,000, $100,000. Here's a chance for you to own 
a piece of a future part of discovery around music. So when people hear music they like, recorded music they like, people are going to tag songs. And when they tag their songs, who knows how useful that will be, but imagine having the data around where people are tagging songs. Yet again, every single record company said to me, Clive, no, people, look at these CDs over here. Look at these CDs, Clive, we're selling. They make us so much money. They make us so much money, these CDs. And um, do you want some CDs? And I said, no, I don't want any CDs. Um, no, people are not going to buy music on their mobile. People are not going to buy music on their mobile. People are not going to buy music on their mobile. So we struggled, quite honestly, for four years because the team were amazing, the product was fantastic. Ironically, we believed at the time the, the name was terrible. And uh, ironically, the, ne the terrible name of the, ne part of the name has become part of its strength because if you c call a company a word that is so unfashionable and is not actually used by anybody else, you have a chance to create a brand that is almost free from any pollution. So this terrible word, it was called Project Shazam, has become there's almost no other Shazams in the world um, in, in terms of all the words. It's like the, it wasn't a made-up word like the trends then became, but it was like, it was like, just, yeah, it was fluke, it was luck. So we, we really struggled, struggled and struggled and struggled. And so it got struggled so bad and we, not enough people were Shazamming. We were baked into phones, doing deals globally doing things with Vodafones, walled gardens, and Motorola phones, really good deals, but there was not enough people using Shazam. And maybe people were right. Maybe people didn't want to tag music. Maybe people didn't know what the song was. Maybe they didn't know. So we was, got so bad, we considered changing the name of the company to 2580, because that was the short code on the phone that you had to remember to tag a song. 2580 down the middle of your phone. There was even radio ads made with a little man singing 2580 down the middle of your phone. My God, I think back, what if we had done that? What if we had done that? We definitely wouldn't have been talking about this tonight. It got so bad by 2007, we had to sell the family silver. We sold the algorithm. BMI, a music tracking company, a publishing a rights company in America, phoned up and said, oh, we could use your algorithm for royalties. It's a brilliant way to collect royalties because we can get computers listening to radio stations and when they're playing Britney Spears, we can work out how many times and we can send them a check. Well, they, sorry, they send us a check, we send them an invoice. So it was like, oh, and the VCs that all come in on a really high valuation on the dream of creating the next big thing said, you've got to sell. You've got to sell? Sold the algorithm for, um, so technically I suppose not to say he's been filmed, so I can't tell you how much he sold it for, a lot of money, which meant all of the Series A's investors got their cash back. I remember getting the letter that said, we've good news, bad news. Good news is we've sold the algorithm and leased it back in per per perpetuity forever for free. Uh, and therefore all the Series A investors got their money back. They would, would have spent I can't tell what the figure is, but millions of dollars getting to that point. Bad news is we're only leaving a certain amount of cash in the company and the current run rate is probably about seven months from the business will go past. Thank you very much. Goodbye. And I said to my wife, it was 2007. Well, that was fun. Learned a huge amount. People weren't obviously going to buy mobiles on their phone. Down the bottom of the letter, there was a tech lead guy called Rowan Power who, oh, P.S., by the way, um, there is a new thing called an iPhone uh, that's just come out, 2007, they are considering allowing people to submit apps onto the iPhone. Everyone's read the book, the iPhone 3, or the iPhone didn't actually have an app store on it. It had apps from day one, Yahoo, YouTube, Weather, etc., but didn't have a store until the 3G model came out. Steve Jobs has publicly um, said that he wasn't sure, that's probably the polite way of saying it, that he should even allow his beautiful device to be infiltrated with our apps. And Eddie Q said, no, no, we're going to give it a go. Why don't we put out an expression of interest, get people, to give us SDK, and see what we get. And then we can decide whether when the 3G was going to come out in March 2008, uh, three, three months later, whether we allow people to um, put apps onto for a public store. The fourth app in the approval queue from an external developer was Rowan Power's app from Shazam. March 2008, by December 2008, I was watching The X Factor in London with my daughter, and I didn't know if something was coming. I remember thinking, well, that's over. 
I, didn't, I wasn't even sure it was on my LinkedIn profile at that point because you don't tend to talk about the things that didn't go so well. And, um, and, uh, and I was like, oh, no. I was sitting down watching The X Factor in London with my daughter. And um, in the middle break, there was a TV ad. And this is how it went. You know when you don't know what song is playing and it's driving you crazy? With the Shazam app from the App Store, you just hold up your iPhone to the song. And in seconds, you'll know who sings it and where to get it. That's the iPhone. Solving life's dilemmas, one app at a time. change and to be honest I was so detached from where the business was that I paused the PVR we have a thing called Sky Plus it's like Foxtel much to the annoyance of my then eight-year-old daughter nine-year-old daughter was watching X Factor and I said to my to wife where's that share certificate where's that share certificate <laughs> <laughs> and um, I phoned up the CFO and said I just I, I just saw a TV ad for Shazam in fact that Saturday I went into Kingston in Surrey and there was Shazam branding all around Apple stores that one of the reasons to buy an iPhone was so you could Shazam song. Seven years later, eight years later, Shazam has uh, eight offices around the world, has 400 staff, has um, 700 million lifetime users, 150 million active users, and I'm pleased to say I played a small but important role in the creation of what's become an internet verb. A really different way for me to experience all the trials and tribulations of a, of a startup. Um, so there's a, you know, just running short of time now, but there's a key things. What about my work at SCI? I'm going to rattle through this pretty quickly. Well, for me, this was uh, something recently I found in relation to um, uh, Scott Cook, who's a you know, really good guy. He doesn't have anything to do with Tesla, but you know, Tesla for me represents this incredible brand and product at the moment. Uh, we've got a really exciting event happening with Tesla um, in Sydney in a couple of months' time. Um, where we're basically going to be showcasing how a connected car can influence and change radio. Connected cars don't simply have the ability to disrupt radio, they also have the ability to totally redefine radio. And that's what we're really trying to do here at SCA. But in the last 12 months, we really pushed forward in some of our digital metrics. And we have become one of Australia's most socially engaged businesses. Over 6 million people following our our, our content on social. Over 70% of our daily traffic now coming from inbound referrals from social. And we've become the number one media company on social, particularly when you rank on engagement. I'm not talking about ranking on fat finger dumb likes here. I'm talking about commenting and sharing, retweeting and favoriting, comment on social, really engagement around our content. And it's driven our social strategy. We're also really obsessing around data. So the location-based data that flows from a connected device. So I'll give you a live demonstration of what that means to us as a business. And you, as some um, uh, you know, really uh, uh, core startup founders and teams will appreciate this. You know, this is something that you do every day. But when I go in to talk to a media company about what we can do on, online now, people get amazed. So this is the number of IP connections in the last 28 days that come to one of our digital assets at SCA. Uh, 4.3 million uh, right across Australia. And of course, we can do what anyone can do with this, which is to um, zoom in and show hotspots. We're mapping every single um, visit to an IP address, putting it on a map because everyone is somewhere. These red hotspots represent where our broadcast businesses have concentration and where the population concentration. And, and you can obviously zoom in even further if you take the beautiful city of Melbourne and you can start to see population density from um, the CBD right out there into regional Victoria. And of course, what you also know, as I mean, plenty of CTOs in the room, but there comes a point on IP address when you can't go any further because the way that um, the, the database uh, aggregates people, it doesn't, these, these people aren't in pubs in these corner streets, it's just that that's a, how far IP address can get you. Well, where am I heading with this? Well, if you hop over to the other view, we are now adding location lookup and single sign into every single one of our products. So going deeper than IP, right down into geo. And of course, if you're just building an app, you're saying big deal. We can do that too. But remember, we're a dumb media company. 
a big dumb media company whose ambition is to locate every single user who comes in for anything from a photo to a visit to a stream to a competition to an advert down to street level and completely change the game around scale and media, targeting content down at street level. So if I take someone here who's up around um, uh, Laverton listening to Fox, this user has not supplied their personal information. That's fine. They're on an iPhone, they're streaming Fox live right now. And then I go compared to this user here, who is a fan of Triple M. How do I know is a fan? Because this user has volunteered their personal information. 34-year-old Mark, and the browser there cut him off. 34-year-old Mark, let's find another one. Uh, another Mark, 38. <laughs> Everyone's called Mark! Who's been streaming uh, Triple M on his iPhone since 528. He's a fan of Triple M. How do I know that? Because he's volunteered his information to his favorite radio station on his device. Yet again, if you're, if you're building mobile startups, this is not new. But for dumb media companies, this is the future. Locating every user down to street level rather than basing their businesses on estimates. And how are we doing it? Well, we're doing incredibly well in terms of mobile. This is the June data where we've become, uh, in, May, in, June, in July we've just gone to number one, but in June we're the second most mobile tagged publisher online, in, in, according to Nielsen. And ourselves in a very entrepreneurial successful Mamma Mia business based in Sydney and Melbourne, you know, we're like two Formula One cars on the grid. We've just gone to 75%. And this is the average of all visits across our 200 sites. 75% of all of our daily visitors across all mobile web, smartphone, desktop, and everything is now on a pocket mobile device. If you add in tablet, it goes to 85%. This is pocket mobile. That's across all of our businesses. If you take some of our more contemporary businesses, like um, Fox FM or Today FM in Sydney, it gets to 85%. And in three or four quarters, we've driven our mobile consumption. We, are, we have no legacy desktop business to protect. I don't care about advertising yields on desktop. I'm simply pushing the mobile future because everything we care about is in our hand. All of the emotion. The irony of all these wonderful billboards all around, airports saying buy watches, buy radio station breakfast shows, the things that people really care about are in our pockets. This is where the value, and I'm sure you realize that. And then that has transformed us, you know, that's a percentage terms, but in terms of scale, we're now the seventh biggest daily mobile publisher on the internet in Australia. The seventh biggest. When I started the business 18 months ago, we were 200. 200 to seven in 17 months. And we have the top five in our sites. Just by being a dumb media company. So finally, what have I learned? Quickly rush these in the cab, trying to give you some lead behind. Things always take longer than you plan. 14 years for Shazam, 14 years. That's a long time, says my wife keeps reminding me. Make sure you've got the right team around you. Pretty obvious, right? But you're in a room of teams. Do you have the right team around you? Is your idea solving a big enough problem? And is it that big enough problem? So for Shazam, the reason why it took 14 years, because it was solving a problem, not a big enough problem, too early on. We were very fortunate we had enough roadway to, to go and with a few key things in our journey to keep us there. Uh, brands are increasingly what, not what we say about them, but what consumers say about them. And again, marketing, but hugely important. What is your conversational strategy? How are you putting your brand onto social? And what are people saying about it? Your market is so much bigger than Australia. Uh, Matt Britton, who's the uh, really uh, uh, smart guy who heads up Google for EMEA, does a fantastic speech when he goes and talks to startups in London as heading up Google's um, office in London and basically says, your market is 600 million people. And everyone goes, well, there's only 60 million people here, and there's only 400 million people in Europe. What's he talking about? The market of people who either have English language as their first language or their second language in the world is 600 million people. So de defining your market that way, not on geography, not on where you are, and in his case, he defined it on language. Get the best advice you can find or can afford, absolutely. Stay the course, things take longer than you plan, but pivot before it's too late. You know, Audioboo absolutely pivoted before it's too late, looked for some behavior inside its community and is now very successful by being the uh, SoundCloud for sport. 
Data is also king. You hear content is king. Data. Data is also king. Make sure you've got all of your first party data locked down, whether it's 500 users or whether it's 5.4 million users. You've got to have that data. Iterate fast, pretty obvious. We know at SCA, we're pushing out products. We're doing it weekly, sprinting weekly, even a dumb corporate, really, really quickly. Don't say, well, we'll put that into that version and roll it up. You know, don't get hung up by Jura's workflow. Just iterate, iterate fast, push out, learn, iterate fast. And aggregation, look for aggregation opportunities. Radio Player was a phenomenal aggregation opportunity that has done really, really well. So that's me, I do, I do a lot of reading, huge amount of learning still to do. I'm currently reading up about the history of, of Australian media, um, the Fairfax story, and all of the amazing stuff that happened there and all the, um, over the last 10 years. <clears throat> Fascinating book. And um, I like a nice quote here, Mahatma Gandhi's, this one is, uh, is definitely preoccupying me at the moment. Uh, live as if you were to die tomorrow, learn as if you were to live forever. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Clive. That was phenomenal. Um, that was really, really interesting. We um, stick to a tight ship here, so we have six minutes for questions. Um, so, <laughs> that's all right. No, no, no um, but so with that in mind, we have a couple of microphones going around the room as well, I believe. If, does anyone have a question? And if so, please wait until the microphone gets to you to ask it. In the back here. Yeah, thank you. It was a very good uh, presentation. I just wanted to know. Uh, how does Shazam monetize? Because I use it all the time, but I actually never pay for anything. So yeah, <laughs> just wondering, I'm probably a typical user of Shazam. Uh, I'd say the majority of Shazam's users will be, um, behave the similar way to you do, yes. So Shazam um, monetizes through a number of different ways. Um, some very obvious ones are that there's a premium versions of the products, <coughs> which are pretty popular, that would take away all of the advertising that you see. Uh, the other one is that by far the most successful one in the last five years has been that um, thankfully enough people use Shazam and then go on after finding a song that they love, finding out what it is, that they go on and buy that song um, via PPD. So, and Shazam is the number one affiliate in the world on iTunes. Number one affiliate in the world on iTunes. Because there are billions and billions and billions of tags and, you, and then you make sense out of every transaction and you've got billions coming in the top and it makes sense at the bottom, you don't need a huge percentage of your billions to make enough money to run a startup. And they, because they are iTunes' number one affiliate in the world, that has been their lifeblood. More recently, they've started to really grow around two things. One is that now people are tagging TV advertising. So if you, I'm sure there's not many free-to-air network TV viewers in the room, but um, there are thankfully quite a few in the world still, and people increasingly encouraged to tag TV advertising that they're interested in. So dual screening with Twitter and um, just dual screening based on browsers. People dual screen with Shazam. Ads, TV ads are Shazamable, And you effectively register your interest in everything from a test drive to a movie to enter a competition. And the Australian office of Shazam is by far the leading place in the world where they generate the most revenue out of that. And now um, content in the Super Bowl, from the Oscars to the Grammys to the Olympics are all Shazamable. And they do deals then with the media networks and the content owners to effectively enable a dual screen conversation. Where the business will go though is there's really amazing insight about four years ago when, um, then when I got a call from Chris Barton and said, brilliant, you know, we've been launching a new version of the app and um, it can now tag a song in less than four seconds. I was like, wow, that's amazing. So what has Avery done? You know, what has Avery done where you can now go take the algorithm down to four seconds? He started laughing at me. He started laughing at me. I said, well, what's funny? Because it's like, think about it, Clive. Why is it possible now to tag a song in four seconds that used to take 10 seconds? Anyone, any ideas? The song is <laughs> not far from the truth. It's not far from the truth. Not far from the truth. You're almost there. It's not that the songs all sound the same, but the vast majority of people who are tagging are tagging only a small number of songs. The product was invented for music lovers like us. The product is used most every day by people who love pop music and love the charts. And it was my daughter in the car about a year ago. I said, oh, she's, can you, can, Mum, can you Shazam this song? And I said, it's Taylor Swift. 
And she went, Dad, Daddy, we don't Shazam songs to find out what they are. We Shazam songs to say that we like them. We like songs that we Shazam. I Shazam five songs a week because that says I'm a Taylor Swift fan. It's a social thing, for particularly for teenagers. It's become like an audio like. And the volumes have just gone crazy. And how have they done it quickly? Because they push a version of the app. They basically, the bottom line is, they know that you're going to tag Taylor Swift. So therefore, you don't need even to use the algorithm to basically, this amazing algorithm, it goes, well, this is Taylor Swift, this is Rihanna. You don't need 10 seconds to tell you it's Taylor Swift and Rihanna. So you're not wrong, you're pretty close. It was basically completely different type of maths. This is about economics, 80-20. So Avery sweating for years to build a database of 20 million songs and ah, I could go off from Bob Dylan to bloody the XX from, from you know, Snow Patrol to, you know, to, to Britney Spears. And in fact, the world loves popular mainstream culture. Look at Spotify. We might love Spotify. The most played songs on Spotify, Jay-Z, Ariana Grande. That's not them fixing it for the record companies. They are the most played songs on Spotify. They're not the most played songs on Spotify, the people in the room but we are not representative of, of, of Western Sydney. So, and that's really how Shazam, <laughs> that was a bit of a delay there, you know, but, um, uh, and it's, uh, it's, become, it's become a mainstream thing. And, and effectively that's now, it's about scale now. A clip of that tiny ticket, hundreds of millions of users. A question here. You've clearly grown up in the UK, European, you know, startup sector, and you've moved to Sydney slash Melbourne, Australia. The conventional wisdom was, if you want to be successful, move out of Australia. You've been here, you've experienced our life and, you know, what the entrepreneurial scene is. What's your impression? Why are you still here? You're excited, obviously, but yeah. what's... How do you think of how things are here compared to, say, UK or where you particularly know? First and foremost, I just like new experience. I've actually worked in 30 different countries and I've never worked here. And I think in our lives we collect experiences. I'm a big on experiences. I'm not big on possessions. I'm big on experiences. And I just want to experience as many different cultures and as I can. Quite, and so my wife and my children feel the same way. Um, but the why here now... Because, in my opinion, in the next 10 years, Australia will be the fastest growing digital economy in the world. It's coming from a low base. Google agrees with me. This is the fastest growing digital economy in the world, coming from a low base in terms of tech and startup. It's got a phenomenally strong economy, regardless of what the Daily Telegraph wants to tell us. And no one's going want, to not want our gold or iron or aluminium or uranium anytime soon. And, um, and it's also in one of the fastest growing regions of the world. So my passion is also Asia Pacific. I don't see this as a uh, disparate European American economy off the coast of you know somewhere else. I see this as an absolute breathing hub of incredible entrepreneurism in the Asia Pacific region. And really, I'm living in what I think is the best city in Asia Pacific, and and that's really how I my aperture. I live in <laughs> the second best city in Australia, uh, Sydney. <clears throat> Uh, I'd live here, but your beaches aren't good enough. I'm sorry. I'm a, I love my, my sea swimming and, uh, you know, swimming for three months of the year in St. Kilda doesn't do it for me. The, um, <laughs> so, uh, um, anyway, so that's really the reason. High growth, high opportunity, um, uh, bringing what's working in these, those markets to here, living in an amazing place, having an in incredible aperture on this part of the world. Um, and I've said I'm here for five years. And I'm here for five years. I've done 18 months. You know, pretty much three and a half years on the dot, um, and I will head somewhere else because it, I'm collecting amazing experiences. No, of course not. I mean, there's a lot of work to do, but um, but the guys at MAP and, and your butter factory and Hub and Polonizer and Startmate and Murudi and Google are really quickly adding to that, and um, and you know, Code Club. Um, you know, we want to establish Code Club as as a Huge part of that. I was meeting the guys from Hub the other day. They, they've already got to, what, three hubs now in Australia. They're talking opening about another 22. They're talking about taking the hub to the, what they call the suburbs. That means regional Australia, creating the hub, and you know, which is obviously collaborative working spaces. So people, there is a handful, more than a handful, of people who feel the same way as I do about the next um, three to five years and beyond. 
wrap it up there because we have gone a bit over time. But uh, Clive, thank you very much for coming down. Very much appreciated. And um, as is um, as is custom, we have a bottle of wine.